So thank you all, all for coming. Can everyone hear? Good. All right. I'm also going to talk to you about worker co-ops. Um, and I'm going to make comments about them, not so much from the psychological perspective that uh, Harriet just did, but from the economics perspective, because that's what I do, and that's what I think can be a nice partner, in a sense, for what Harriet has talked to you about. Let me begin with a little bit of history, which is very important. Worker co-ops, and by that I mean very clearly a workplace, an enterprise, a factory, an office, a store, whatever, that is run by all the workers there in a democratic way. One worker, one vote. This is actually something difficult for an American audience to get their heads around. So if you have a hard time thinking about it, that's not your problem. You're, there's nothing wrong with you. It's just unusual to imagine that when you got to work, you had no rank relative to other people in making all the big decisions, that you were part of the decision-making apparatus, what that enterprise would produce, what method of production it would choose to use, machines, this kind, that kind, more machines, all of the technical questions you would be deciding. So what to produce, how to produce, where the production would take place, here or there, this part of town, that part of town, in the United States, in China, where? And finally, and probably most important, you would be part of a democratic debating, decision-making operation, deciding what to do with the profits that all of you, as a collective of workers, produced in this business this year. A democratic workplace. That's what worker co-op means when I use the term. It's as old as Methuselah. 900 years, if I remember the Bible right. It's very old. There's, this is not a new idea. This is not something that was invented this year or this century. It is very very old. If I had more time, I'd talk to you about some of the old experiences. The one I like to tell in American audiences is a group of people back in colonial America, before we were an independent country, a group of people that are still around. They're called the Shakers. Some of you have heard about them. They make fantastic furniture that is still a, a, an elegant way, a simple way of making furniture. The Shakers still exist. Pit Pittsfield, Massachusetts is the base, but they're in many parts of the United States. They organized all production, including of that famous furniture, as worker co-ops. Workers together, democratically deciding what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and what to do with the profits. By the way, you might be interested, the majority of the workers in the Shaker workshops were women. And the reason they were women is that the Shakers had a very interesting concept. They were called Shakers because one of their religious commitments was to avoid the practice of sex. So instead of whatever relief they might have gotten in that form, they got together and shook, literally. That's why they were called Shakers. They shook. Believe me, if you want odd sexuality, that was not that big a deal. We're way ahead of them now. They shook. But they did something else. They said to any woman who came to the Shaker communities, with or without children, that if she explained that she was leaving an abusive relationship, a batterer, a husband who mistreated her, they took her in with her children. This was at a time where women like that had absolutely no place to go, no one to take them in. And so one of the reasons that was filled with women, it was a place to which women came, especially when the word got out that you would be taken care of and your children, you'd be fed, you'd be housed, you'd be clothed, and you'd be given 
a job. So that's part of American history, this worker co-op. And if you never heard about the Shakers other than they shook instead of had sex or they made beautiful furniture, if the part about the worker co-op was left out, that should give you a clue about the problem of our educational system. It's not a fault of yours. How would you know? In Europe, the two countries that have more worker co-ops than anywhere else are Spain and Italy, but number one, Italy. For those of you who might be interested, you might want to visit one day the area called Emilia-Romagna. It's a big part of the Italian country. It's one of their big regions. 40% of the economy of Emilia-Romagna is worker co-ops, lots of them. They develop because it's an old tradition in that part of the world to organize work that way as a collective. The people who organized that years ago took as their rationale the Bible, in this case, the Roman Catholic Bible or the Roman Catholic interpretation. So for those of you who wonder, is this something that can be understood, justified, rationalized in terms of Christian ideology? The answer is, oh sure, plenty of examples. In the north of Spain, Harriet has told you about the Mondragon Corporation, just a history, started by a Roman Catholic priest, Father Arismendi. That's why the name of that bakery chain, for those of you who don't know, here in the San Francisco area, is called the Arismendi Bakeries. That's named after the priest in Mondragon, that little city in the north of Spain, in the foothills of the Pyrenees Mountains. That was the name of that priest, Father Arismendi. He made a joke as the local parish priest. If we all wait for jobs until some capitalist comes into town and offers us a job, we will all die of old age. And when everybody finished giggling, he said, look, you know what would be smarter? We become our own capitalist. We become our own boss. Or in simple English, we'll be a co-op. We'll be not just the worker, but the boss too. That way we don't have to wait for someone else to come in and be the boss. With six workers, 1956, he begins. And as Harriet told you, it's about 100,000 now. Seventh largest corporation in Spain. Mondragon Cooperative Corporation is a family of about 150, 200 co-ops. In everything from retail to manufacturing to agriculture, you name it, they do it. They have their own university. They have their own research labs. Their research labs are among the most advanced in the world, particularly on electric automobile technology. There are two American corporations that are so taken with the quality of the research done by this worker co-op institution that they pay them so that their scientists, Americans, can work alongside of them in the labs there in uh, Mondragon. So I thought you might be interested in the names of the two American corporations that pay them. You've heard of them. One is called General Motors and the other one is called Microsoft. You never heard about American companies paying worker co-ops for their advanced technology? Of course not. Of course you haven't. Worker co-ops are old. This is not a new idea. It's an alternative, the worker co-op. It's an alternative way to organize your work life. You might want to think about that, since that's where you spend most of your adult life. Five out of seven days, as an adult, you go to work. You probably get up, prepare for work, then you travel to work, then you do the work, and then you recover from the work so that you can do it again tomorrow. I know that may de be depressing for some of you, but it is a way of understanding that work is a very big part of your life. And so you shouldn't be surprised that human beings for a long time have figured out it might be nice to organize the work in a gratifyingly developmental way for the human being since you spend so much time there. So people have formed co-ops as a better way to get that time spent 
to make it more valuable to themselves for a long time. Well, then why haven't you heard more about it? Why haven't you heard about the American worker co-ops? They're all over the place. And the foreign worker co-ops? Well, there are good reasons. First of all, a worker co-op makes the alternative, a capitalist enterprise, look not so good. You kind of already know this, but let me make sure it's in your head. You go to work in a capitalist enterprise. Somebody else tells you what to do. It's sort of like you cross this threshold into the business and all that stuff about democracy, participating in the decisions that shape your life, all of that is left on the coat hanger with your jacket. That's not acceptable inside. You don't participate in making the decisions. The company decides what you're to work at, where you're to work, with what machinery you're to work, with what raw materials you're going to work. You're to use your brains and muscle, but you're to do it in a way you're told to do. And then the big moment. You're done. The day is over. It's 5 o'clock. What you poured your creativity into, your brains, your muscle, your energy, it stays where you work. You go home. And for those of you that occasionally take something from work home with you are shortly thereafter visited by people in dark blue uniforms who hurt you to help you remember not to do that in the future. I know a few folks are creative and manage it nonetheless, but you get the idea. What you do, you're told to do. And what you've produced belongs immediately to somebody else, not to you. Here's the deal. At the end of the week, you get some money in your hand. That's, your, that's what you get. Everything else that you've produced belongs to somebody else. Is it really surprising that human beings have looked at that and said, Ugh, I don't want that. Is there an alternative? It's a question that probably occurs to nearly everybody. And the question is, has someone offered you an answer? Well, if you had a proper history of the way work has been organized, you all would not need me at all. You would already know that worker co-ops has been an alternative. A democratic worker organization of the workplace is very old because people have wanted it, needed it, yearned for it for a long time. It's an alternative to capitalism. And therein lies a, clue, a very important clue. We did talk about worker co-ops in the United States. The Shakers were proud of the worker co-ops that their women worked in. They didn't hide them. They didn't worry, gee, this isn't capitalist, it didn't occur to them. They thought it was a wonderful Christian way to organize production as did many other uh, co-ops. Indeed, worker co-ops in America have often been religiously organized. Some of you know that there are certain kinds of jams and jellies you can buy with names like Brother This or Sister That or the Trappist Monks jams and jellies. You know why that is? Because religious orders organize their productions in worker cooperative mechanisms. Wow. So what happened? Why and when did people become nervous, shy about talking about this, not making the history clear to one another, not learning in school about this other way of organizing production? a collective, democratic, doing it together, making the workplace, dare I say it, a community without hierarchy, without a boss. I've been a professor all my adult life. 
the beginning of all my lectures, I used to teach very large classes at the University of Massachusetts where I was a professor, and sometimes I had as many as six or 700 students in a big auditorium. And I would always hand out at the beginning of the semester, first day of class, a little piece of paper. And I would ask them questions so I would know a little bit better who I'm talking to. What is your major? What part of the country do you come from? That kind of thing. And then always I asked the question, tell me in 10 words, what you hope will be your situation five years after you graduate, economically speaking? I always got the same answer. Overwhelming majority of my students said to me, I want to be my own boss. I don't want to work for somebody else. I always thought that was stunning. That was a very powerful comment by these young people on the lives they saw their parents living. They didn't want that. They wanted to be their own boss. When I then informed them that the prospects of getting that outcome were slim to none, they were depressed. And then I could explain to them why that was. You want to be your own boss. Guess what? Worker co-op is the best chance you have to ever get near that in a capitalist system. It's the way it is. So why didn't we learn all of this? This has to do with the Cold War. We've had co-ops all along American history. But after World War II, the co-op movement, for very good reasons, decided uh-oh, we got to be very careful now. And why was that? Because it's starting in 1946 and 47, for those of you not familiar with American history, let me remind you. We had just been in a Great Depression. Capitalism wasn't looking real good in the Great Depression because everybody was in trouble. You all do remember, 1933, the unemployment rate is 25%. That's five times worse than it is officially now. That was really bad. Capitalism was held responsible for that. Because capitalism wasn't looking real good. And then we went to war, World War II. And the big ally of the United States in World War II, and it's always stunning to me how many Americans in my audiences don't know what I'm about to tell you. The big ally of the United States in the, Soviet in the World War II, I just gave it away, was the Soviet Union, Russia. American post offices had that famous picture. Uncle Sam with the top hat, the whole thing. Uncle Sam, arm in arm, with somebody called Uncle Joe. Joe was Joseph Stalin. And when you bought your postcard, you had a smiling Joe Stalin looking down on you. So at the end of World War II, American businesses were very upset. Capitalism had a bad name, and we were the best friends with <gasps> the communists. Can you imagine? Not only that, we had a president who had given the mass of people social security, unemployment compensation, a public jobs program, a minimum wage, all kinds of things which conservatives and businesses didn't like. So they decided to push all of this back, undo the New Deal. And how did you do that? You attacked the political coalition that created the New Deal. And again, for those of you not up on your American history, when the economy collapsed in 1929, things changed very quickly in America, much more profoundly than they have since 2008, at least so far. American workers got angry, not at immigrants, not at politicians, but at the capitalist system. So here's what they did. They joined unions by the millions was the greatest organizing drive in American history. Unions never achieved that before. They never achieved it since. The CIO, it was the name of the organization that put it all together. And they did that together with two big socialist parties. My apologies if this troubles some of you. Uh, 
I know the American history you had left all of this out. And a big communist party that worked with the CIO, producing an enormous pressure from below. And they went to see the president, who had to see them because they represented 50 million people. And they said to the president, you got to do something for us. Because if you don't, we won't vote for you anymore and you won't be president. And then the socialists and communists piped up, oh, it's worse than that, Mr. President. We're going to make a revolution here, like in Russia. And Roosevelt was a good politician. He knew they weren't bluffing. He went back to the rich and the powerful of whom he was a part. And he said, I just had this meeting and these people, this is what they told me. And my advice to you, big business folks, my friends, my neighbors, is to give me the money to take care of them. Because if you don't, you're not going to have any money to give anybody anyway. So you got not much to lose. Half of them were convinced. The other half never were. The descendants of the half who were not convinced, the Koch brothers. The people who were convinced, that was the alliance. That was enough for Roosevelt to create social security in the middle of the Depression, unemployment compensation, to pass the minimum wage, and to create 15 million public jobs, building things like, I don't know, the Golden Gate Bridge, among other things. Wow. So after World War II, all of this had to be pushed back. And the way you did that was to destroy that coalition of communist, socialists, and unions. And how do you destroy a coalition? You pick on the weakest link. And the weakest link was the Communist Party. And what you did is you went to work and you said, you know those communists who helped organize the unions? That's not really what they were doing. They were agents of a foreign power. Ooh, that's scary. And you got rid of them. You put them in jail, you deported them, you did all the things. Check it out in your history if you have some time. And as soon as you were done with the communists, you went after the socialists. And you explained to the American people something many of them still believe. That a socialist is just like a communist, except they spell it differently. By the way, when I go to Europe, I talk to people about socialists and communists. Everybody in the audience understands the difference. Here in the United States, I explain socialist and communist. Everybody thinks it's a synonym. At first, I used to think that people are stupid. They're not stupid. That's a part of our education. We, would, we taught our people that. Today, most Americans that I encounter in my classes, my students, think that socialist, communist, Marxist, anarchist, it's all the same. Some of them add liberal and Muslim. It's all the same. They're bad people. We even have fairly important candidates who pretty much say that. So it's popular. Well, in that moment, in that spirit, American worker co-ops said, uh-oh, we who believe in organizing the workplace as a cooperative, we could be called communists, socialists, Radical, and so the American cooperative movement, consciously, unconsciously, made a decision. A decision I understand. I probably would have made it myself. We've got to somehow take this co-op idea and uh, hide it, minimize it. A co-op then should become a, a kind of nice and cuddly sort of thing that nice people, particularly in little towns, do when they get together to grow organic turnips. Or nice religious people, a little odd, but you know, they're religious. They do, they, they like to be nice to one another. It became something marginal to society. Not threatening anybody, not an alternative to capital. Oh no, just a nice little corner of a perfectly okay capitalist system. Something that wasn't all that important, didn't involve all that many people. Nothing for you to be taught about. 
Nothing for you to think about. Nothing for you to worry about. Nothing. It's barely even there. Which puts me in the awkward position of having to tell you, of course it's there. It's been there for thousands of years. We now have to bring back into American culture and civilization an awareness of an alternative to the capitalist economic system that was always there. In order for us to say what? To say nowadays, 2016, we've got a capitalism that really isn't working real well. And therefore it's more urgent than ever to look at what the alternatives might be to which we might look as a way forward. Let me drive that point home as I work towards the conclusion. The capitalism we live in, this system and organized so that every enterprise is a dictatorship, and there really is no other way to say this, even though that may upset you just for a moment. A tiny group of people make all the decisions. These people are called major shareholders and the board of directors. So let's be sure we all understand what I just said. Shareholders, you most of you know that most of America's corporations, on all of the large ones, are share-owning companies. They're companies that have shares that you can buy on the stock market and thereby you become an owner of the company to the degree that you own shares. You may not know that 1% of the share owners own 75% of the shares. In economics, we refer to share ownership as being highly concentrated. That's a vague term. Occupy Wall Street refers to the 1%. That's a precise term. That gets it right on the nose. 1% are the major shareholders. Why are they important? Because the people who make all the decisions in a corporation are the board of directors. In most corporations, that's 15 to 20 people, individuals, just like you and I in this room. Who decides who's on the board of directors? The shareholders. Once a year in every corporation, the shareholders have a vote. They decide who is on the board of directors. Who will be those 15 people? All any of you have to do to be on the board of directors of Apple Incorporated is to get the shareholders to vote for you. Then you're on. If they vote for you, you're on. If they don't, you're not. How does it work? You get one vote for every share. So if you're very wealthy and you have a million shares, you get a million votes. If alternatively, your grandmother, who unfortunately died last year, left you 11 shares as her bequest, you have 11 votes. If you were so unfortunate as to have no votes of, uh, no shares of Apple, then that's how many votes you get. None. 1% of the people have 75% of the votes. You understand, a tiny group of people pick the board of directors. Those 15 people hear the decisions they make. What your company produces, how it goes about it, where the production occurs, and what is done with the profits. There's the root of our capitalist economic system, how it's organized at the workplace. The vast majority of people are hired by the board of directors in any corporation. They're the bosses. You're not. They make all the decisions. You don't. That's not a democracy. That's an autocracy. That's a dictatorship. If not of one person, then of a very small number. They make all the decisions. Wow. That might not be so bad if it worked out for you. 